Okay, Deanna, I'm recording now. Okay, cool. So today I'm excited. I'm, I'm with Deanna. Deanna, nice to have you here. How are you today? Deanna Aguilar. I want to see you try that. Aguilar? Aguilar. Very good. Okay, it doesn't, yeah. you have to roll the R a bit? <laughs> Okay, okay. So I'm gonna have you to have get to roll it. Yeah. Cool. Well, nice to have you on here today. Yeah. So um, so normally I start with uh, you know, where did we meet? And some people are like, Oh, we met 10 years ago here and here at this meetup. But you and I we met not too long ago. It was like less than a week ago. It was on it was like yeah, it yeah like and it was on was Clubhouse, right? Was it, was it Clubhouse? It was yeah. Yeah, yeah, we met on Clubhouse. No, no, it wasn't Clubhouse. No, no, Clubhouse. Clubhouse. It was Spaces. Yeah, Twitter, Twitter Spaces. Call. Yes, 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 yes. Twitter Spaces. Twitter Spaces. Twitter Spaces, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. And so thanks for coming on, you know, on whatever I call it, Bitcoin Stories. And I'm just trying to get, you know, different people's perspectives from all over the world um, in terms of, you know, what their, their, their story is. You know, normally it's like, uh, well, tell us your story in 30 seconds and then we'll, you know, kind of get to the all time high and talk about the, well, I'm kind of doing the opposite. So I'm not, no, not so many charts and things like that. You know, other, other shows are covering that. It's more about the stories, the stories. So I know, I mean, I, again, we haven't talked all that much, but from what I've heard, I feel like you have a very interesting story, fascinating one. So I will, you know, turn it over to you. What's your story? Whoa. Okay, well, first of all, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a mean question because it's too general and people never know what to say about themselves. I don't trust people who already know what to say about themselves. They seem to, um, they, they seem to structure. So so, so let me give you let me give you a bit more let me give you a bit more then so <laughs> yeah. so so some people okay so i i do like to keep it in terms of what's your story but if i had to put some filters in there obviously it's called bitcoin stories so i maybe not for you maybe for you uh the learning of bitcoin or crypto tends to be a bit of a singularity event like a a point in time where beyond which we couldn't even have imagined before we learned about it that you could maybe have a possibility to create a better world so so i guess what's your story some people start with their great grandparents in world war ii and this and that some people start with their first job i don't know when you tell people your story where does it begin <laughs> well, i'm an Venezuelan. i have no european descendants to get a very very sad world war ii story from uh, but I can <laughs> tell you this, um, <laughs> yeah, um, being Venezuelan means that right now, being Venezuelan means that you are a fighter. So, and in, in my generation, particularly, you know, the, the 90s babies, um, we all came sort of like these experts. So pseudo experts, if you may, on political science and how economics works, because uh, Venezuela itself turned uh, in the in the time that I I lived there and that I was raised there, turned into this very um, uh, big petri dish, perhaps we could call it that, of experimentation on socialism, broken economics. Uh, very corrupted politics and all kind of uh, weird experiments that have, could be done. Um, they were done there, basically, in my country. So we've been through it all, really. And actually, my like like I said, <laughs> you, you want me to throw some spice in it, but yeah, my my Bitcoin experience started basically with my first job as a journalist. Um, what really attached me from the from, from the very beginning was that I had this uh, very cool phone call with the uh, one that will be my boss for for my experience there during my experience there. Um, he was very cool about it. He called me and he was baffled because my curriculum said journalist, and if you know anything about the crypto space is that uh, right now there is more and more journalists but back in 2016 there were not a lot of journalists to be said the least um in news platforms uh, in niche crypto news platforms right um so he really wanted me there 
So we spoke for about an hour, only about Bitcoin. He will tell me everything about it. I'm not a financial or technological person. I'm not, I'm not wired that way, you know. I didn't grow up with an iPad in my hand. My first cell phone, I had it when I was in fourth grade. And, it, and for me, it, it, it was this Nokia, you know, that we call it block. You could kill a person with that. <laughs> you could just smack them in the head. And, I remember uh, it. I, I couldn't even play games with it or anything. It was a really, 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 it was a really, really old phone. Um, so I grew up with that setting. So they tell me Bitcoin and I was like, and at that point, it's 2016, we, we are, it, Venezuela has already, at this point, if I'm not mistaken, has already recognized that we are living a, an economic crisis. So, you know, I'm still saying, no, I want to be paid in Bolivares. But it's like saying, I, I know I want to be paying dirt. Thank you. Uh, in Monopoly, <laughs> in Monopoly, uh, one of what we build, basically, uh, because I didn't understand this well. But what I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a person that is really drawn towards education and informing people. I really love that. So when that day, during that call, that was did exactly the same for me. I felt like I could actually start learning and I started to fell a little bit for this, for this ecosystem. And moving forward, um, just in my experience, because just like you, I love making interviews. I might start interviewing you back without noticing, you have to tell me. <laughs> um, I, I also fell in love with, uh, with the idealistic, many times idealistic, uh, perception that people have on um, crypto, especially Bitcoin, right? But that's basically how everything started. Like I come with this mindset, this mainly millennial mindset, if you may, um, and also understanding the setting where crypto might or may not be useful because I really have been through uh, a lot of very special circumstances that you only do in a crisis. And I have used crypto and I have known its limits. So that's a little bit of background on that. Well, I'm interested in, in getting into those limits, uh, you know, and, and by the way, in terms of the cross interview, I'd be down if you want to do that later on another time uh, you want to interview me. I'm, I'm an open book. I do this uh, almost every day. Now I interview people and sure. make content. I, I don't know how it happened, but I think it's this, this, this virus, right? It's just like, I was like, what else am I going to do? <laughs> You're not allowed to leave your house. So uh, right. Um, and so anyway, so, but uh, just, uh, I, I'm really curious to build a lingual net. I just want to mention one thing. Have you ever heard of Ledin? Have you ever heard of a company called Ledin, yeah. L-E-D-N, Mauricio? Yeah. Mauricio but, so Mauricio Romeo was my, Andres are some of my favorite people. <laughs> oh, Mauricio was my first oh, interview yeah. on, they were my first interview, uh, on this podcast. So like, I, I think a hundred episodes ago or something, they were my first, uh, uh, Mauricio was. I actually, knew that you were talking about him. You mentioned them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm. I so, 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 so they. So they. They you were the. So, who escaped from Venezuela. Yeah. So if you want to know why I actually <laughs> doing this podcast now, I remember they. They when I heard their story about Venezuela and what they went through because they shared kind of everything, it was. Um, it was, it was moving. Cause I, like I said, it's like, you know, the all time highs and all that stuff is fun. But when you start to th realize that it's like, you know, that it, it, in some circumstances, it can save people's lives. I think it's very fascinating. However, however, you also mentioned in our Twitter spaces call, I, I love that by the way, I'm so glad it's happening. I think voice is like, it's about time, right? Social voice. This thing is, this thing is very fascinating for me, but I, I think, I think, you know, um, I'm really interested in hearing your perspective. So, so what what are the limits? You know, coming from your perspective, you're a journalist. You've been, you know, you've been vocal about this. So, what's been, you know, your kind of kind of your narrative around it? Well, first of all, yeah, the narrative it's kind of, um, and and it shouldn't be, but it is uh, kind of conflicted mm. because it's limitless money. So. <laughs> 
like most things in programming, nothing is an absolute. That's include that includes the term limitless. Limitless, we are we are calling the the money when it's digital and it can go across borders without a third party, basically. Put it very very broadly. That is limitless. What is not limitless? It is um. Or, or it could be, but, but only submitted to a ton of development in the future because I'm going to say the, the famous cliche, the famous cliche phrase, we're not there yet. <laughs> so um, it is not limitless uh, for a person that, I don't know, just say, it, many, many people say, oh, you can use crypto for, uh, Cross for payments, you can, you know, uh, help your parents and family abroad using crypto. Yes, many people do that. I have done that, for example, uh, talking already me being here and helping my parents when they were back in Venezuela. Uh, but the thing is that the possibility of doing it doesn't mean that it's the best way to do it. So for example, there are processes that, I don't know, uh, if you want to send money, let's say from Argentina to Venezuela, in the first instance, uh, if you're just an immigrant and you don't have any documents and you don't have, I, I mentioned some of this, right? Um, in, the, in, the, in that first call that, that we have, we did a bunch of cool people back in Twitter spaces, but, um, just reviewing on that, the experience of having to send money uh, from one country to another implies, for example, in this case of Bitcoin, because that's the most used cryptocurrency at the moment, and it, it, it is the one that has the most liquidity, you know, uh, you can exchange uh, for better prices uh, than using other cryptocurrencies. Um, the thing is that, for example, the commissions are very, very high. So uh, this doesn't actually, uh, this is not uh, a tempting alternative for someone that wants to, I don't know, I want to send 10 bucks to my parents and the commission is at $8. The same thing can happen with DAI, for example, a stable coin. Uh, I bought 10 DAI using Binance, for example, and to move it, I need 15 DAI. <laughs> <laughs> so crypto it yeah it, it 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 can be very freaking it can be very freaking expensive to use that's my point right mm. uh and it is while well the well the solution itself the process itself it is helpful because it allows you to move without having to depend on a central identity uh, i'm sorry a, a central um institution sorry um you do uh, need it to be uh, cheaper. You do need it to be uh, less complicated to use. And that is where, that is where everything you know, clashes. That, that's where the clash is. Oh, there's all the information on the internet. Why can't you just learn? Oh, why can't you just adapt it to what I already know? You know, and that's, where, that's where my... That, that's where I really get sassy <laughs> because um, I have really used a lot of crypto services. I have, uh, and I, I, ha I have invested in Bitcoin without having any financial education. And that cost me thousands of dollars that I couldn't afford to lose. I lost a lot of money that I couldn't afford to lose. Mm. And I'm still here. And I'm still informing and I'm still educating myself. Uh, no hard feeling because uh, of my decisions, but I do recognize from that moment on that there is a narrative in general that praises Bitcoin above anything else, but leaves outside the basic need of financial education that it, it's required it is required. You cannot just tell your grandma to start 
buying Bitcoin, you cannot just tell your parents to carelessly move all of their funds uh, mm -hmm. to a cryptocurrency if they don't know um, not only how to make this process, right? Because that's the list of it. That is the list of it. We teach them how to use a mouse. We teach them how to use internet. We teach them how to make a TikTok. We can teach them how to use digital tools. That's the list of it. The real issue is um, having a non-financial educated, mm -hmm. let alone non-technical. I'm talking financially. Mm. Non-financial uh, non uh, educated people into uh, a, a very big and savage rodeo of investment where you can lose a lot of money that you might need because it was sold as this ultimate great solution, right? So there's a lot of narrative around um, how Bitcoin saves life and how Bitcoin is great and how Bitcoin because we're talking about Bitcoin here, right? But this narrative that can be applied to any other cryptocurrency that says to do the same. Um, but I have I have seen it in, 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 in the first person uh, that the people that crave Bitcoin the most either already have the financial intelligence to know when not to depend on it. Using Bitcoin means not to depend on it. You're depending on it as a long-term investment, I have noticed. It's not like, oh, when I, I know that whenever I need money, I will just take Bitcoin. No, because that was the narrative last year. This year is you lose money when you sell Bitcoin. So don't touch it. And that wasn't the narrative last year or the last year or the last year before that. It wasn't in 2016 when I started here, right? Because uh, the, the more the, the market grows, the more the people in it are more and more aware that it's going to keep growing because that's the projection, for example. And if so, then I shouldn't be selling it. And that's when people uh, start being able to have a, a real um, awareness on how to actually use Bitcoin. It's not a savings account that you can, uh, you know, that, that you can just take the same amount of money that you had yesterday due to a correction, for example. You cannot say, well, what happened to me was I have 2,000 grand from a job that I had and I was saving it to get my parents out of Venezuela. That was in 2019. What happened in 2019 when it was a freaking huge correction and I no longer could help my parents. You know, I was I I, I had my hands tied because all of my funds were in Bitcoin. I was doing the exact same thing that I was taught to do, that I was set to do, that the whole hype was around it. If you don't have all your funds in Bitcoin, who has all their funds in Bitcoin? Who can afford to do such things? Someone who already has their mm -hmm. income in another local currency. Someone who already has a diverse uh, a portfolio. Mm -hmm. Someone who already knows how to manage a stable fund so you don't actually have to depend on an investment that can have such high highs and low lows, right? Uh, but I didn't, I didn't knew that until I had such huge hits and that wasn't even the first time that I lost money with it, with it but it was the most uh, frustrating time uh, because yeah, it, the money you can recover but uh, it, it, it was a time where I put my trust blindly in a narrative that doesn't suit reality and how many people how, how, how much Hey, uh, Deanna, I lost you there for like just the last sentence. I'm going to pause it. I'm providing 
Hey, Deanna, I lost you there for a few seconds there. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, sorry. Can you repeat that? I lost you for like the last sentence or two. Oh, I, I was just saying that how many more people uh, have to have to learn the hard way how to use Bitcoin instead of the very same people making the solution and hyping the market, providing safe financial education for people not to lose their money. Like, uh, why does it have to be such a hard road? You know, um, but that, that's the thing. That's why I, I get so critical. Not of Bitcoin itself. Bitcoin is like, it's, a, it's, a, it's an open software. Bitcoin, Bitcoin doesn't have to fall. Bitcoin, it's a, it's a great invention. I'm talking about Bitcoin solution. I'm talking about Bitcoin services. I'm talking about uh, platforms that use Bitcoin and people that hype Bitcoin when it's when when it has so such long road yet to 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 be done, you know, for for um, the proper adaptation and adoption. Because right now it's it's a it's an unnecessary as I see it. It's an unnecessary uh, tough love kind of approach, but it's not even tough love, it's negligence. Right now, uh, I see that the, 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 the community can be very negligent towards newcomers to Bitcoin because of that. It's easier for, uh, it's easy for me if you just take the hit than teaching you how to do it properly. And that really needs to change. I have a question for you. I have a question for you. Do you this um, narrative around essentially like hodling, but then, you know, dollar cost averaging, do you think that is a slightly more um, nuanced, do you, you know what I mean, right? Dollar cost averaging, this, this idea. And by the way, just on that note, I, I think it's a very valid one. Um, I agree with you because I've been in this space for 10 years and I've seen the highs and the lows and, and it can get really, really ugly uh, when those, you know, those uh, bear markets come. Right. And so, so yeah, so, and I, and I agree. And I think, and, and if you notice the first thing I said at the beginning of this interview, which I say in at the beginning of all my interviews is that I'm not so excited about the all-time highs because they come and go and, you know, they're almost irrelevant. What I'm more excited about are like, how people are able to sustainably build their life around Bitcoin, right? Whether it's writing, whether it's building businesses, whether it's, um, you know, being a singer or whatever it may be. Um, and, and, and I think you, I mean, it does open up. I mean, Bitcoin has many, many elements to it. I, I agree. The, the, the fees are high on it now, especially because of all the demand. Right. And, and, and that's, uh, that that's one of the major, you know, I would say criticisms and, and, you know, the fact that it's, uh, like you said, when you, when you have some Bitcoin, you get paid in it. If you have to pay, I don't know what it is, $15 or something in fees, that might not seem like much to some parts of the world, but other parts of the world, $15 could be like, I don't know, a, a, a day's type of, uh, expenditure or something like that or income. So, 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 um, what, I guess my question would be is, um, at the end of the day, like you said, Bitcoin itself doesn't have a soul. It's not a person. You know, it's just a group of people coming together. Um, but what what have you done, I guess, in response to your experience? <laughs> you know, have you now embarked upon a journey to try and educate people or build tools that maybe don't entrap people? You know, and and, and you know, I used to be a financial advisor, so. I take for granted a lot of basic things like, you know, you should have savings, you shouldn't be in debt. Yeah, but I also remember when I used to be a financial, yeah. nine out of 10 people you'd meet have so much debt. They're just like drowning in debt. Um, and so, yeah, ideally you should be paying off all your debts. You should have savings and they call it an emergency fund. You should have three to six months worth of whatever your monthly expenses are in the bank like in cash in fiat because mm. because mm. <laughs> and only then do you start you know hodling and dollar cost averaging a certain percentage of your income uh, in the yeah, long term but, but yeah you're right it gets over overlooked at home it's a very valid point right mm. yeah you don't yeah you don't get that kind of education at home that's my whole point like mm. you can have uh very educated parents i did i did uh my 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 dad has a seven pages worth curriculum 
is my freaking hero. He's an academic, but very much rich dad, poor dad. He just like this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, I it was literally like that. Like I, I was raised by very very smart people. My mom hey, herself, she uh, she has a she she has a god. She, she, she has a cut for, for investment. She's very, very smart in that sense. And she's not dedicated to that area, but she just knows, you know. Uh, but she never fully uh, got into finances, even though she likes it. So I was never, I, I was never taught anything what you just said. I learned it by saying, oh, I'm in my 20s. I would really, really like not to have to work when I, when I'm my parents' age, <laughs> um, so what I can, what can I do about it? Okay, I already lost everything. Bitcoin, so Bitcoin wasn't the answer. There goes three years of my life believing the hype, um, because uh, even with the highs and lows, uh, when you're living in Venezuela, that it has gotten pretty expensive, by the way. But um, the the thing is that things between can be translated to dollars uh you can you can afford not to think so much uh, about how much money you're losing with the high with the highs and lows because uh it's a still way more it is still way more than than earning in bolivar right so that was the thing i i i, I bet i bet you that i lost a lot of money <laughs> in commissions in lows um you know, I uh, I got used to get paid on it and never like diversifying the portfolio, just saving it. And by the time that I needed to go to, to leave Venezuela, I only have $500 with me working Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I left the country with $800 that I earned working on the side and that I had in in uh in physical i had it in cash and that was what saved me when i arrived to argentina because i literally had nothing else if i didn't have those savings it would have been way harder for me to to find uh, stability in the first few months that are always very very hard because living your country is not a vacation mm, so uh, true. So basically, that that that's what that's what really rings the bell for me. Uh, the, uh, the sudden uh, realization that I needed to do better. So, were you able to eventually figure out how to liquidate your Bitcoin, or did it? Uh, what did, what ended up happening yeah. there? Yeah, and like what what, what are things like local Bitcoins? Like what what do people use? Like, uh, well, uh, talking from the. Latin American experience, though I could tell you a thing or two about the United States because I was a funny one, but um, grounding in Latin America. Um, basically, yes, you are more than able to, to use your Bitcoins. At least what I did was paying half my tickets out of uh, Venezuela using Bitcoins. Mm. I, I, get, I, I got out with the help of that. Uh, of, of um, an acquaintance here in Argentina. So uh, the fact that I had been saving for three years and that at the point where I needed my money, I didn't have it. I didn't have enough, not even to pay for a plane ticket. That was the first low blow for me, like the, the, real, the really hard one because I, I, I lost money. I mm -hmm. lost a ton of money in what is supposed to be the money that will save me, right? So that was the first one. Then I arrived and I was still uh, in freelance jobs that paid me with Bitcoin. So what I did was that since you're an immigrant, you don't have any documents uh, to open a bank account. At least in Argentina, there are a very few banks that I wasn't aware about. I think that I can only think of one right now, one bank uh, that will allow you to open a bank account only using your passport. Uh, but I didn't know about them. 
So what I managed to do was that, okay, I don't have any of the, op of, of the options of exchange uh, to, send my, to, to send funds to me uh, using, for example, local Bitcoin. Uh, that, that is the platform that I use the most because it, it is one of the biggest, what are you gonna do? And have the biggest liquidity. So, you know, when you want to get a good offer, usually you go there, but there's a, a ton of others and it can vary. You know, you have to you have to go picking your the, the services that that best uh, suits you. But when I realized that I didn't have the means to open uh, a bank account in any of the options uh, that there are here, you know, I don't I I didn't have a Santander account. I didn't have uh, a whatever whatever. You know that the, the the official bank from here, the Central Bank of Argentina, I couldn't open a bank account, etc. So, what I managed to do was to find. I think that is the only place, if not in Argentina, in the capital, uh, Buenos Aires, that will allow me to directly exchange the Bitcoin for. Uh, cash in pesos, and I will take this trip like every two weeks, perhaps, exchanging bitcoins for pesos. But I will have to go there, and that will be like an hour and a half of travel, going and one and a half returning because I have to stay uh, outside of the city when I when I first came here. So it was. It was so much work. Mm -hmm. It was so much work just to exchange my money, just to move my money. Um, I, I, it was a very hard time as an immigrant using this for the for the first time that uh, having to report to this. And this even this even wasn't the first time that I looked that using cryptocurrencies in a so called uh, crypto friendly country. Uh, it, it can be very difficult because. Um, when, in 2017, I went to Colombia to cover a conference called La Bitcoin. I don't know if you have heard of it. I have. I've interviewed those guys. I interviewed uh, the organizers. Rodolfo, yeah, he's pretty cool too. The thing is that when I got there, my boss was so sure that I could manage myself using only cryptocurrencies that guess who had to call everyone she knew when she was at the airport so someone could please pay her taxi because I didn't have enough for a cab. I didn't have anything because that's just do not accept Bitcoins in Colombia. I couldn't even move from the airport. What did you do? And again, I I called everyone I knew <laughs> until someone had the had had the, the the very nice gesture of calling me a new Uber from the and Bitcoin conference. I, I was uh, that was a kid from the Bitcoin conference. Uh, his name is. He was. Uh, I cannot remember the the last name. And I really don't want oh, to. That's okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so Bitcoiners can be a rescue. Uh, I guess it's not all bad. Uh, but yeah, Bitcoiners came to a rescue, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So like you said, though, you know, Bitcoin doesn't have any emotions, right? It's about Bitcoiners. Um, I mean, it sounds like, uh, you know, maybe being advised that you should just go full Bitcoin at any point in time probably was not the best uh, advice because you need fiat, um, you know, to operate in the world. Because <laughs> that's unfortunately, I mean, I'd like to believe that, you know, it's more ubiquitous, right? but it no, isn't. When I, when I went to Hawaii, it was the same thing. Mm. Yeah, Uruguay is uh, the, the, if not the first, one of the, it, it's from the top of uh, the fintech industry in Latin America. Like Uruguay is another level. Right. And when I went there again, I almost starved to death because I was so sure that I could change my Bitcoin. There, instead of having to use dollars to go to an exchange and exchange for pesos, I was like, 
everyone is going to be there. I can exchange something. I almost start. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay, don't okay, just from this day on though, don't ever do that. Always have uh from fiat. Anna, yeah. <laughs> Like they, like, like, yeah, like they, like the crypto not tourism is not even close. No, like the crypto, yeah, being a crypto tourist involved. I have learned this, as we can see, because I'm very stubborn. As we can see, uh, I I have learned that you really need to establish um connections. You really need that peer to peer, uh, thing going. Uh, because otherwise, it's just going to be too hard it's going to be um you, you have uh, and, and I, i'm not even the first one to realize that there's a bunch of people that that have uh this oh uh, by the way i i i, I run a show called i run a show called bitcoin stories and i agree with you <laughs> like you should never go full bitcoin right i mean like you have to live life like what do you mean like uh i'm surprised that people are going around telling you that that you should be a hundred percent bitcoin <laughs> that just sounds weird um yeah well have, have you have you known crypto twitter let me introduce you oh my goodness but that's, but that's not real that, life that that way, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah no no but don't don't do, that. don't do that don't do that don't do that what 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 <laughs> say that again it's like dude get out of your house <laughs> oh yeah people are saying the world outside yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is an argument around maybe not um, owning real estate, like owning Bitcoin versus real estate. That that I, I can get with. Like you could rent. I mean, I have no problem with that. Um, I, but I, I do believe in, anyways, yeah, sound financial management, <laughs> that comes first. And Bitcoin is a highly speculative asset. Like let's put it where it is. And it could go down 90% tomorrow. And you have to be okay with that. Uh, I mean, that's, that's part of the, yeah. So um, more people should know. Yeah. And this is why I'm doing, you know, and then, and then when you get into Bitcoin, you know, if you learn all those lessons that you should, you know, you should have emergency fund and normal fiat. That's how the normal world works. You should be dollar cost averaging in. You should be hodling for the long term. Um, then once you get into Bitcoin, oh my God, there's so it's like a it's like a it's like a like a maze of of things that that are going on of like everyone trying to take your Bitcoin, right? Because ICOs or DeFi now it's NFTs, and tomorrow it'll be something else, and everyone's doing a little song and dance to get your Bitcoin. So. Um, so yes, I agree. I think, I think, I think it's very hard. It's very hard. And it's like, there's not enough education around it and, and more should be, <laughs> man. It's, uh, yeah. on Twitter, on a clubhouse, even I get a little bit tired of, you know, of like just the, the over kind of bullishness, but you know, when you only have so many few characters to talk people just kind of do whatever is kind of like, and, and, and this is why I'm personally doing these YouTube videos because you can be a bit more nuanced and you can share your actual thoughts without, you know, having to, 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 to kind of like feel like you're, you're tiptoeing or whatever. Right. It, it's just that I really think because again, like recording stories, getting to know people and getting out there and actually testing because that is what, that is what's really exciting, you know, not mm. screaming and making theories and getting and getting and, and getting pesky and getting, you know, like uh, getting uh, even violent, you know, or or troll about the the your idea of how it's supposed to work mm -hmm. because the math works. No, no, no. The protocol is one thing. The system is one thing. What happens inside of a computer and that wonderful set of blocks, it is one thing. The other thing is the real world where you are trying to apply this, mm -hmm. right? That is the whole other thing. I have a question. That is what is the, really oh, sorry, so exciting. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead. I don't want to interrupt. Go ahead, continue. Uh, no, 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 that, that is what I really find so exciting to, to actually test it out um, and see what it works and see what it could work and see what it doesn't work. Because um, as we get realistic, we actually start to see a new way on how to use this type of technology. But we cannot do that unless we actually test it out. Right. If we only stay in the theoretical, 
and we only treat the, the white paper of Bitcoin as it was freaking Moises, <laughs> you know, instead of the Ninth Amendment, nine pages of the white paper. <laughs> uh, you know, if you don't actually get to test that out, you will never actually know uh, what, why this technology is so cool. You will only stay in the, in the dreamy part. And it really needs to be better than that. Okay, your turn. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I was going to ask you, though, is, is that, you know, for, I, I know you know the Venezuela story because you're from Venezuela. <laughs> but I, I think I have a pretty yeah. global audience now. Um, and if we kind of, like, I, I agree with you, by the way, okay? I agree with you that you should not just only have Bitcoin. I agree with you that the fees are becoming an issue for people that are holding, you know, less than thousands of dollars of Bitcoin. Um, I agree with you that it's not optimal for a lot of reasons. Um, but if we had to distill it down to, you know, you, you called, I think it wasn't my words, you said you referred to the Venezuelan currency as dirt or something like that, like getting paid in that, right? So does it solve okay. for that problem, at least of inflation, I guess, in the longer term? Yes, I agree in the one year, six month span. But if you look at the 10 year history of Bitcoin, it is, I mean, it's gone down that we've seen, I think, three or four, 70 or 80 percent corrections. But by and large, it's gone from, at least in my experience, I've seen it go from $10 to what is it today? 60, 70,000. I've lost track, $1,000. Meaning oh. over the arc of yeah, time, yeah, yeah. does it solve for that basic thesis, right? Of, of money <laughs> around, you know, preservation wow. of value. No, it's just that uh, you're talking about two different things. I, right? I'm asking about that. Yeah. So to put it, yeah, yeah. To put it, to put it, Simply, um, many people in Venezuela don't have ten dollars and don't have ten years to wait for those ten dollars if they had them uh, to not eat, but to dedicate it to investment. That's the thing. Ten dollars again might sound super like like nothing. But right now, the minimum wage in Venezuela is in between two and four dollars. I don't have ten years. I don't have. I I, I cannot spend. I cannot spend, uh, and wait when I need to spend in staying alive, mm. in paying rent, in eating, in feeding my family. That's the thing with investment that, uh. Yes, anyone can invest. It only takes one dollar, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> mm. But it doesn't occur, it doesn't occur um, without this, without financial education that clearly this type of crisis either make it go make it go faster, people realizing how money works, or uh, and this has happened a lot because again, my parents think like that and my parents so the best stuff and the worst of uh, Venezuelan economy. So, for example, they still believe in, in the thing in real estate in Venezuela. Say that again. They still believe in. Um, oh, they believe uh, in real estate, estate in Venezuela. Real estate. Okay. Yeah, and, and actually, there's a whole movement around that because there's there's the hope because Venezuela is it's beautiful, it's beautiful, funny. My country is gorgeous. And there's a lot of uh, great opportunity for real estate, for example, but there's only one tiny thing that we need to get rid of. So, yeah. <laughs> you don't know what that little thing is. So, but that little that thing, is. that little thing seems like it's so getting. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that thing seems like it. Does yeah. it seem like to you is getting smaller or bigger globally? What thing? The dictatorship thing. Like globally, when you look out yeah. into like the other parts of the world, are you feeling like positive? Like, you know, that Venezuela is this petri dish, or do you feel like that petri dish now is kind of uh, spilling out into the rest of the world, and more of that is coming elsewhere? The thing is that. 
the dictatorship is the result of Venezuela in particular doesn't quite uh, can compare to any of the present dictatorships. Because in the case of Venezuela, we have, for example, the fact that it's not only the current dictator that is enforcing the dictatorship itself. It's because there's a lot of common interests interest around my country. Uh, a, a lot of countries basically gain from Venezuela staying in a, in a dictatorship because they have already made all the all the links to get what they want from it. Mm. So Venezuela has not only a ton of natural resources that has been and can be exploited uh, in benefit of China, Russia, Iran, you name it, the United States itself. Um, but also uh, we have frontiers with other countries. So you have a bunch of drug, drug problems. You have a bunch of um, guerrilla, uh, a, you know, illegal militia, you know, going on. You have a ton of issues that are linked to international influence. So it takes more than, in the case of Venezuela, it takes more than, oh, just, you know, just shoot them. I have heard that many times. Oh, well, it's just a problem. I, 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 like just do like this. I know when I interviewed uh, the guys <laughs> from Lead In, they were. Uh, they were telling me about there was like an uprising happening it was maybe a year or two ago i forget when it was exactly but it was maybe um and there was like an uprising happening there was like a group of people or like i remember one gentleman specifically that they'd mentioned who was kind of standing up against the regime etc cetera, etc cetera. but but i mean like when you say that little thing right it's kind of a big thing i mean i know you're just kind of joking about it but it is kind of a big thing in the sense that i yeah. i i <laughs> worry a lot about it i'm not gonna lie i i worry about it not just in venezuela but it being elsewhere right like all over the world um because I, I, I but i'm just curious like as someone who kind of lived through it are you able to kind of talk about like some of these like patterns of uh or like pair or like yeah patterns yeah. that 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 maybe yeah, you yeah, see sure. that playing out so i don't necessarily mean like international influence like i i'm sure that's a factor as well right i don't disagree um but i'm what no, i'm, what I'm more what talking mean, about like, is this like idea of socialism of idea? yeah like because socialism yeah, is, yeah. i feel like I like i feel like most people at least where I'm coming from, like North America and, you know, Europe, let's say like that viewpoint, um, you know, obviously I have, I, I started India's first Bitcoin exchange. So I have, I have, I, but I'm not an Indian itself. I'm from Canada. And so when I say, so, but I feel like people on, on this side of the world don't really get what socialism is or, or what even like a dictatorship, how yeah, it eventually yeah, is. No, I get it. But I'm just curious, like how, what, oh. like how did it even come about? Were you, were you alive? I mean, yeah, were you born into it? Like, were, did, were you born and like the regime was there, or was it something that had come after? The regime itself started with the election of a former military that was also um, a former. Uh, Sorry, my, my English and my Spanish are having a fight in my brain. Spanglish? Um, Spanglish, yeah. You wouldn't get it. <laughs> you need to learn Spanish. Um, okay. Hablo Espanol. Um, I, okay. Recluso. Preso. A former... Uh, what? A former... and i said to my mother mommy i do not like this man why is this my name i remember that distinctly and i didn't know who he was but i had plenty of time to discover later so I 
remember a happier time in my childhood? I'm not. Um, hey, by the way, oh no, I think I paused it because you were breaking off and then I just hit record again. Oh no, but I might've missed the best part. Can you rewind? Can you say, can, and I, and I kind of lost you there. Can you rewind a bit before all this? Sorry. Oh, I feel so bad. Good job, Sunny. <laughs> it's like the, oh, okay, sorry. But yeah, you got to rewind a bit. I'm sorry. I kind of dropped the ball. No, no, don't worry. Um, actually just give me one second because I have to, I, I have to send just one message. <laughs> because yeah, yeah, no it problem. has been a, a wonderful hour. Oh, right. We, we only had an hour. Sorry. I don't do this thing for 90 minutes. I'm going to pause. I just have a call. One. Okay. We're back. Okay. So I think we covered a lot of ground there in terms of, like I said, like I said, your story and all of that. So I think, was there anything else you wanted to touch on with regard to your story before we moved on? To cut more like your writing and journalism and I don't know. Kind yeah, of the well, there. I don't want to throw you under the bus, but there were <laughs> there were pretty cool things. I'm a pretty we good swimmer. It's going to be tough, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, um, we were we were actually talking about things, but I think that they're very important to leave uh to leave recorded uh recorded. Um, yes. Yeah. First of all, talking about my story also. Uh, there is a fact on how the perspective of being Venezuelan affects your views on crypto. And I was just telling you a little bit about um, how I remember how everything started with the dictatorship that we now have in Venezuela and how that makes me and many Venezuelans able to um, be able to perceive certain red flags that can be seen still today in the international um, the international uh, landscape, right? Yeah. So right. basically, uh, I remember that it was 1999, and a former inmate and militiaman called Hugo Chavez uh, won the presidency at the time. And I remember that they cast the vote and he appeared on television and I was six years old. And I told my mom, mommy, I do not like this man. Why is he smiling? So fast forward, that is how many people of my generation live uh, through this era. We weren't born into the dictatorship, but we grew with it, right? And Basically, I'm with another millennial here to also remember. <laughs> and uh, basically, that give uh, at each change that was happening, it was like a like a characteristic that we record in our mind, so we can see it exemplified in another country, and we immediately have a trauma response. So. Socialism. Socialism only works when mixed with democracy, right? Or when people say, oh, socialism has worked in other countries. And they can only name what Switzerland, I don't remember the name of the country. <laughs> Nordic countries. Yeah, Nordic countries mostly. Um, hey, this is my interview, shut up. So, <laughs> Social democracy. Social democracy, yeah. Um, yeah, Venezuelans, we have a very strong opinion, so we can. When you hear someone uh, talking about it, we really have to chime in. Um, <laughs> because uh, basically, we are born, um, we, are, we are raised learning about the political, uh, how this political changes, because we have lived through it. Uh, we, we learn how these political changes can actually affect your life. So that's why we're so. That's why I call it trauma response. Um, so when we say socialism, there's a lot of people who believe in socialism that are in Bitcoin. Actually, many people see Bitcoin as, as a socialist system, right? Because everyone's the same in the, in the code, you know, all the blocks and all the nodes. And uh, that's a pretty view. 
but it doesn't apply to pol to politics and it doesn't apply to economics. And it can it it, it is actually a uh, a uh, a drive towards corruption because socialist uh, well capitalism is portrayed as the worst thing in the world like uh, it's it's uh, it's a, it's also savage it's a it's a savage economic system I'm not going to deny that uh, you get paid for the work. You don't. Uh, you, you don't need to be. You don't have to have an alliance with the government in in order to gain certain benefits. You earn them through your work, right? If you don't work, you don't get paid. If you work, uh, you get paid, basically, right? And I'm not saying that uh, the the capitalism is perfect. But socialism certainly isn't, and don't get me started on communism, right? So, yes, we see a lot of people that like to paint a pretty picture on socialism because they're so fed up with capitalism. Oh, it's, oh, I feel for you. It must be so hard to have all the means to live with. Uh, life quality, the quality of life, instead of being afraid that if you don't belong to a certain sector of the government, someone is going to literally put you in a black list. That happened in Venezuela. If, you, um, if you're working for the government, then you are allowed certain benefits. But if you vote against them as a citizen, then they can revoke those benefits, they can throw you out in the streets, they can uh, never let you progress inside of the company that you're in. They will, uh, you know, the, even and even the, the, the benefits, the so-called benefits, for example, they're for government employees. Uh, some of the benefits that they can give you is uh, boxes of food. Just so you have an idea, of how uh, negligent the system has come to now, if they give you food, that's an excellent. It's not that you can afford the food with what they're paying you. They're giving out the food for you. Be grateful, right? I'm not paying you enough for you to go and do grocery shopping of whatever you want and whatever you need for a month for you and your family. I'm going to give you the food in a box. And it's going to be whatever food I feel like giving you. So, uh, if you if you retire, they might still give you the freaking box. And the pension, if you retire again, yeah, my my dad used to be used to be working for the government, and he retired. He's sixty. Hmm. And uh, we live through that. We live through that. We we will eat with that with that box. It's called a clap box. I don't remember what clap stands for, but it's called like that. It's, it's pretty common to to hear about them in Venezuela. And uh, the benefit that my dad will have will be minimum, and with with his retirement payment, that will be nothing. It will be less than what my mother earned, actually, as I retire uh, in her retirement too. And my dad worked in the petroleum, in the oil industry, just so you can get a picture. Venezuela is famous for her oil, for for our oil industry, and my dad was earning less in his retirement, seven pages one curriculum. Then my mom, a retired teacher. So, and for kids. But 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 it doesn't it doesn't start that way, right? Um, in the sense that it's it's more about what it's about equal distribution of wealth and everyone should, uh, you know, I mean I've been hearing this term like okay. equal opportunity versus okay. equal outcome, like I guess. 
I don't even know where I'm going with this, but I think this is a pretty okay, big. Just, just, yeah, just, yeah, just yeah. To go ahead. Go ahead. Idea. Okay. This is how, this is how it started in Venezuela, mm. and you can tell me if you can see an example, right? So, in Venezuela it started because of this, basically. It because what? There were forty years. Mm. Uh, there were four years of democracy. Uh, because first we had a dictatorship, right? The, uh, the dictator got overthrown, and then it started the with the pacto of Punto Fijo. Um, there was an alliance there, right, of all the opposition leaders, and we started 40 years of democracy. During these 40 years, Venezuela tried and became the mecca of Latin America. Everybody wanted to go to, to Latin America. It was one of the times where we had everything. The, the fashion industry went there, you know, the best chocolate, the best of everything was there. And everybody wanted to live in Venezuela. Everybody wanted to what work year? in what Venezuela. Year was this? What years were that, they in? Those were the, yeah, those were the golden 60s, 70s, and 80s. Interesting. Okay, okay. Just as, yeah, just Google it. You will mm. fall in love. It was amazing. It was amazing. Um, and well, most of our parents lived through that era. So just just picture that for a moment, right? Just stay in that moment for a, just just picture it because it's wonderful. Everything worked. The the Bolivar. You, you could go anywhere you wanted. Many people could do exactly what many people in Europe and the States can afford to do even today. It's which is oh I felt like going on vacations to Egypt. I can go to China if I want. I can go to Japan and pay with Bolivar. That is unattainable for me to imagine right now. That doesn't make sense to me right now. But in that moment we were thriving. We were one. We were the biggest economy in Latin America, and one of the biggest in the world. And we were the first. Uh, we were the first in in oil industry because Venezuela had a ton of oil. That's the best way that I can portray it. We we haven't. It it has been uh, almost half a decade or more than half, uh, half a decade. No, sorry, half a century, over half a century. And there's still oil that we are living from. But I, now I will proceed. <laughs> After painting this pretty picture, I will proceed to go into the decade. These 40 years of democracy weren't perfect, OK? It all ended up uh, being, uh, let's say, a transaction between two parties, two main parties uh, of the opposition. So for four years, your president of your party gets to do whatever he wants, and then it is my turn. So people they started to get fed up with that because that will apply to everything. Again, corruption at a government uh, at, a, at a government level. My grandma will say this to me, and also my mother. Uh, for example, they will work in telecommunications and. Uh, or, or the police. And if one of the party leaders of one of the, when, if not if, when one of the opposition leaders of one of the opposition groups uh, won the, the presidency, everything shifted. Like the, the job that the, 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 um, the boss that you had will change for another that was alive to the to to to, the, to to this party. And four years later, maybe your old boss will be back because he was alive to the other party. That's it. They will do this ping pong, this political ping pong, where uh, you know people started to get fed up with that. And you know, we were happy we didn't know it. And that's when corruption happened at a great scale. It was in the 70s, if, um, no, it was in the 80s in 
in ninety in the ninety nine, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there was this huge corruption scandal, and the and and it, and there was uh, an attempt to overturn the government. Behind this uh, behind this attempt, there was a young dictator. <laughs> There was a young dictator, a militiaman, uh, that was just, you know, re uh, portrayed as this huge hero because he was speaking in the name of the people. So it didn't work, but eventually uh, the people said, we don't want you anymore. And this last democracy era president left. Then the vice president uh, came in as an, uh, how do you say, uh, like a, a, the vice president stepped step up as a president for a while, as a temporary president. And he pardoned, he, he considered pardon to the young dictator, who then uh, proceeded to use his story as an impulse to apply for president. And that is how it all started. That is very, very, very uh, resume, very, very, it's a very little resume of how it all started. Like people thought that this one act of corruption from the, you know, from the, uh, from the late presidency and the presidency before, but you know, this was the last straw. Uh, it, everything will change thanks to this visionary and, you know, man of the people. Later on, well, not so late, the first, the first thing that he did was try to change the constitution. That was the very first thing. When you see a president trying to do that, like, you know, it starts thinking. Uh, another thing was, uh, course was very rich against the poor. Uh, that that's also like a like something to look out for. Uh, he was a, his his discourse was money is bad. I grew up with that. Money is bad. People who have money are bad. Not everyone should be poor. Is that money is bad? Do what you want with it. Money is bad. You know. So he will demonize people who had uh, more means than others because he himself grew up very resented uh, in poverty in a, in a forgotten town in in some in, in one of the in one of the states of Venezuela called Barina. and uh, you know it's it, it's all very novelesque you know it's all very like out of uh, out out of a very dark literature uh, literature piece, but it's the truth. Uh, he grew up in poverty, resenting people who had more than him, and then escalated to became president. And you could see it all so transparently portrayed in his discourse. So then it comes populism. That was his tragedy, and that's other things that you need to look for. Because that is very that is, that is very easy to see, but it's plain manipulation. Uh, polit uh, politics always say what people want to hear. Doesn't matter uh, what type of uh, what, what type of um, belief uh, they aim for, right? It can be democracy, it can be socialism, it can be communism, whatever. But populism, it, it is very, um, it is very united to to socialism because you, uh, what you're doing is um, is doing a, something that is very common at least in Venezuelan politics, which is putting the president in the same in the same level at the same level as the rest of us, and that is something that we don't actually 
see in other in other presidencies because um usually the president needs to be someone who has uh studies who has who's in that at a, another at another level right so you could see for example uh images of Hugo Chavez Diaz talking to to the public in uh in one of his chats with the people he will do that on the regular and it will be four hours long chat uh we will call it chain or cadena uh chains of television televised chain uh he will just stop everything he will just stop whatever was going on on television and the radio and it will just be him and this is when the dictatorship itself starts he will proceed to to make announcements that was later on that was uh 2000 maybe i don't remember exactly when he started to do this but it was like a like a uh like a signature move of his regime he will go and tell the people what was going to happen now he will say from now on we're not speaking anymore to the united states that's it whatever says whatever says constraint you will only figure it out in this in the, in the weeks to come but you, you never knew you, you will only be shocked because it he talked about it with eloquence as it was something that he was just talking to his wife on the side. Like it was just a commentary, not the not the future of the nation, right? And then he started to fire people on camera for everyone to see. From now on, and he will just he will just read it. Uh he will call people by name. Call them names and announced that they were fired. He will fire presidents of companies that supplied to the to the country. He will fire people from the militia. He will fire people on TV. That's why people will be hooked up to what he had to say on TV during this, those four hours because he never knew what he was going to come up with next or if he was going to call their name. Um, you could see pictures of him with a with a bag of of milk over his head, making fun, doing you know, saying funny stuff. And that's something that his successor actually has also started doing right away. They like uh make a make a circus, an actual circus out of politics. And you learn to be very wary of all of this. And you recognize the discourse, the resentment, you recognize the strategies to manipulate the people, to make them believe that you're giving them something, but actually you're taking from them, uh, you're taking their power of decision, you're taking their possibilities of acquisition, you are taking, you know, uh, everything that you can from them. Uh, it, there, there was a time uh, where the palace government will make it look like we were still in the golden era. So people will, you know, be able to, for example, apply to something called a uh, Kadivi coupon. It was $2,000 on credit that you could use to travel. You could, you could just apply to it in the bank. My first time traveling with my family, my, my first and only time that I got to visit with my family outside of my country, uh, the United States, actually, it was using one of these coupons. Do you know what happened? In that same trip, the government announced, he announced, that now the coupon we're out. So me and my family got stranded in the state for a week. Only with the money that my parents got to 
to to bring with them in cash. Thank the Lord, the state has very cheap food, and we are already have paid for everything for this, this staying and everything. But uh, we survived with like fifty bucks for a month. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's just that's just crazy. That's scary. And um, yeah, yeah, I've heard of those stories where he just used to walk down the street and like pull out shop owners and be like, okay, you know, you no longer own this store. I have a question though. Yeah. Like what like you said that, you know, Venezuela was going through this like golden era, right? Where, where people were enlightened and people were probably running businesses and like you said fashion and maybe even like people from all over the world and latin america are moving there so when this happens um don't those people kind of go wait no oh, it oh, it get something's not right or 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 does it just happen so slowly and so sneakily and they just disguise it that like or or is it that they just make examples of those people that speak up against it or how does it how do they kind of like yeah what do they do with those okay. people <laughs> the thing is that at least in, in what you need to understand or well, maybe you can because it, it hasn't been your experience but something very important is that uh, because of what I told you, right? Like the like a classic politic uh, move in Venezuela at least, but it's very common in Latin America. But I've only seen it portrayed at this uh, at, at, in this magnitude in in, in Venezuela. Uh, it's making it personal, right? The president that is supposed to be this high figure actually putting himself at the level of the of the citizen which is not a it's not a smart move uh the thing is that you can say that chavez showed his true colors uh when he got power and he tried to reform the constitution. Mm. He, um, the, the very first thing that he did was that, and the country was not happy about it because it was pretty obvious that he wanted control. And people pick up on that very quickly. Like, we just came from democracy. You, you won't fool us like that, right? So there was an attempt to throw him out of power. And in 2000 and Two, there was uh, there was this huge uprising, and there was something called uh, a national. The word in the word in Spanish is paro. There was a paro nacional. It means that all all the businesses and everything, 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 everything closed, and. People weren't going to work until he left office. Like the whole country stopped producing. That was the whole plan. And uh, he had to step out. He had to. We're talking about we're, we're talking about everyone just you know like we're not going to work anymore until you leave because we don't want you as a president. And that happened pretty early on. That happened only. Like a year and a half, maybe, since he stepped into office. Like people pick up on that very quickly. And then what happened? The thing was, the thing was that we weren't united as people. That's, that's what always happened in the Venezuelan history. That's very sad. But people started to go to work again. Wait, but he he backed out. Uh, you said they stopped working. He stepped down, and then they did. Then there was no plan to replace him. I guess or. Uh no. There there was there was this dispute around that, and not everybody got on board. Uh, with the not working thing, that would have worked actually, and then there was this huge, um. 
a, a very famous march that, that happened, a very huge protest that actually turned into tragedy. Uh, 11th April, April 11th of 2004, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, basically, that's, that's another time where we understood that we were stepping into what will become a military dictatorship. That means using of guns to, to um, control the people. Because during this protest, where people were, you know, demanding for, for this uh, so-called president to leave office, he, um, he pointed guns and gave the order to start shooting people in the crowd. And that was the first of many times this government will do exactly the same. And when you talk with Mauricio and his brother, I'm pretty sure that he was telling you about one of those times where we thought that we could beat it in the street. And they probably shoot at us again and torture us and take us prisoners Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Because that was that's what this dictatorship does. Doesn't hesitate to use um, violence. So, um, actually, Chavez got to go to jail. I remember. I remember this in in pieces, right? Because I'm telling you this with my memory of a twelve year old, perhaps. I remember that everyone in, in the house was so happy. I remember that one of my aunts was, was in tears of happiness, saying, they're going to put him away for good. They're going to put him away for good. And we were hoping that he actually was in jail, but he, he went out again. And the people, and, and the people who, who he knew that had helped trying to take him down, uh, he banished them from government or took them prisoner. Everybody that he knew that was against his government, he used like this, um, he used this tactic of just keeping records of people. Oh, so while I was in prison, they were talking shit about me, like they were happy about it. You wouldn't hear about those people again. Like not at not at the same capacity, and he actually took a lot of measures to, uh, to punish, openly punish people who were against his government. One of the most famous ones are the, for example, the Tascon list. Basically, there was a list of people who voted against him in uh, in further elections. Um, those people had a terrible time finding jobs afterwards. It's named after the, the person who, who leaked the list of, of voters. And that's why a lot of people in Venezuela also have a very hard time trusting in, in voting <laughs> because you never know who's going to keep your data and then what are going to be at this point, what are going to be the the consequences, right, of the government knowing about you. So uh, it has just been this ongoing, it's, it's so much, it's a lot, I know. It's just an ongoing uh, list of irregularities, of corruption, of violence, of uh, saying one thing on the side and doing another, were super used we're super used of not hearing them what they say because we know that it is all like a like a it's a trick you know like a magician look here while I'm doing something here but we have learned to look here first 
we don't hear you. We're we're seeing what you're doing first. Uh, because everything happens on the side and we didn't learn that until very late because in democracy things happen in the eye of the of the people right uh, at, at least that is what it is supposed to be it's supposed to be at, at, at some point it's politics it's supposed uh, to be transparent uh, 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 hey by the way i think we've gone way we way stuff. I think we've gone way over time, which is fine with me because I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, and I really thank you for, for sharing so much. Yeah. Um, uh, hey, oh, can you hear me okay still, Deanna? Hello? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Deanna, I was going to ask you one thing. Um, with COVID, with COVID, this whole virus thing that's happening now, you know, the virus, the pandemic, <laughs> do you think this is making the world more or less like your home country, you know, it's the country you were born in, Venezuela? Like in the sense that, uh, you know, is it creating more dependency on the government or less, you know, is it, uh, is it allowing the free market and the average person around the world to thrive or, or maybe... I don't know. Do you have you ever thought about that or? <laughs> no, I never thought about that because in the case of because in the case of Venezuela, um, what's really what's really striking about a pandemic is that uh, the health system is collapsed mm. completely before the pandemic. It was already collapsed. So the hopelessness that you can feel in Venezuela during a pandemic added to all the other crises, it's a hundred, a thousand times worse, a million times worse. Mm. Uh, because all the other things, um, there's a, a, at least in the case of a pandemic outside of Venezuela, you know that the government has striving for having the, 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 the vaccines or already working on them. In the case of Venezuela, the dictatorship uh, blocks not only uh, not, not, not doesn't have only blocked and persecuted humanitarian help, persecuted actively persecuted organizations that are trying to help people to have medicine. That already that has that that, that was already happening. The thing is that they are also avoiding the Pfizer vaccine to get to the country. Because anything that comes from the state, they don't want it, even if it's for saving lives. So in the case of Venezuela, uh, no, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't compare my the, what is happening to my country even in this time mm. to what is happening somewhere else. Because at least in Argentina, doesn't COVID, I can go out, I, I can, I, I can still give my money, and uh, you know. There has been more regulations and there has been more control of the government, but they won't shoot you. Mm, yeah. <laughs> if you go out. They won't shoot There's that little you. thing again. That we go with so much to that little thing. It's not the same living in a, in a dictatorship mm. during a pandemic that living somewhere else. How, how long have you been in Argentina now? For a couple, for a year or? For almost two years i'm about to get my permanent residency identity card and how's your life in argentina now lonely lonely yeah it's Is a it... migrant story it's supposed mm. to be like that <laughs> and how are you battling but loneliness hmm? <laughs> uh, being fruitful being productive Mm. Uh, I have been learning a lot, working a lot. Uh, it is lonely in the sense uh, that you go through something that many people have gone through. I'm not the first one. I'm, I'm wanting, what, six million, seven million people. We don't know all the records for sure, but of Venezuelans that have left the country. And uh, the thing is that it, its experience is unique. So at least uh, when I got here, I miss my parents terribly. I miss mm. my family terribly. 
and then I started to live on my own. Uh, and it was the same thing, you know, because it's trauma. It's a trauma living your country under these circumstances. Again, it's not a vacation. It's not like, oh, I have always dreamed of going to Argentina. Hmm, I cannot wait. Yeah. No, it all happened. I, I took the decision of going to Argentina during, during a blackout. That that's just I I mean unimaginable for me I can't even and, and so and so I guess you know just to switch gears a little bit so what is your uh what do you, what's your art now I mean we didn't talk much about it but you are essentially a journalist right and are you focused on the crypto space or you're kind of is that one of the many areas you cover? I've always been I'm I'm focused I will never say a specialized I'm focused uh in the crypto space I have. I, I'm, I'm one of the few journalists that I know of, at least in Spanish, that has made her, her whole career since graduating in crypto. So all my experience is in crypto. How many years but have you been? Is, how many years have you been in crypto? Then, five years. Five years. That's an eternity. That's like that's forever. <laughs> that's in, how that's how you've been. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I really like it because as a, as a journalist, um, the thing with crypto is that it's money, right? If you see it as money, how, how many stories aren't related to money, to money struggles, to money corruption, to, to money for, for, making, for doing good things, right? Mm. So I, I learned to step out of the niche, talking only in technical terms, to actually talk about the actual uh influence and the actual impact that crypto can actually have that's it uh and and since i started doing that i started to learn more and more and more like i told you from the beginning i am very critical of bitcoin and i'm very crit uh, critical of the cryptocurrency ecosystem uh, as a whole when it comes to uh, providing services and products because i have used them in real life so when you start to report on that actually there's this there's a ton of, of, of things that you can touch being a journalist. It, I, I have talked about the corruption in my country. I have talked, I, I have talked about uh, injustices. I'm very, I'm very vocal about what is happening in my country. And I always uh, look for spaces uh, like my own channel, the blog code. I, I created one to make interviews and, and, and to use it as a, 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 as a place where where to speak out about about everything crypto, but in reality, uh, and I don't know, it it goes like this whole conversation. It goes way beyond just crypto. It is yeah. about uh, the the life, uh, the the life that that and the background that that form this ecosystem and help it uh, that get get built. Right. So when I when I learned to see it from from that perspective, not only the niche per perspective, uh, it, it got wider. My world didn't get wider because of crypto, but it gets wider because of the of the perspective that I learned to have from it. You know, uh, if that makes sense, I I, I really like uh, getting to know. Uh, the, the stories of, of people in crypto just like you but it goes way beyond just crypto that's it yeah yeah no I agree I, I and you're right you're right money is so like um universal and like power and you know corruption and all of it you know recently I I've been doing these interviews I told you right I'm on almost episode 100 um I was thinking of of turning around and taking some of this footage and and starting to tell at least my version of of like the stories like the crypto bitcoin stories in every country. So I, I have a you know I have a very kind of long relationship with India um and you know and so I wanted to start start there but then work my way to Canada and Maybe, you know, Venezuela was actually my third country that I wanted to focus on um, just because 
I don't know. I mean, uh, I hear all the all the other stories, but I feel like it, there's, there's still a lot to be told. Let's just put it that way. And then when I watch Netflix and all these other things, I'm just like, these are so boring. Like people just need to just spend one day in Bitcoin and they'll they'll stop watching all this. Um, but yeah, but so maybe we can collaborate on, you know, the Latin America version or something like that when I get to it. <laughs> I'd love to. Mm. I really love to. One of my projects involves uh, traveling across Latin America uh, mm. and just talking to people because that's something that I actually am already doing here in Argentina. Argentina has a very fruitful uh, set of communities. It's not our community. It's a set of communities in several different uh, districts and parts of the of the country. And uh, I have been talking to them. I have been actually putting on my mask and going up to talk to them. And it has been great. So yeah, we could. It, it will be amazing to collaborate on something like that. Cool, cool. I'll keep you the loop. I'm just kind of in the early days of it. I won't even mention the website yet, just because uh, we did we did get something. We're just gonna start uh, working at it, but yeah very exciting okay so maybe we'll we'll finish up with this last question which is what is one thing that you believe to be true and i maybe already had the answer to this but what is one thing that you believe to be true that most others in bitcoin would disagree with you on is that it, it's what it's it's not limitless it's limited <laughs> or did i get it backwards <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it is limitless but limit limited <laughs> So yeah, I, I would really say that at least at least uh for now for the present being in the reality that is applied and as blockchain, uh it's a technology that is that is limited. It's a it's a, it's a accountability system. You know, it doesn't cure cancer. It it would only keep your transactions uh with a time stuff. That's what we, that's what it does. And um, you know, it, it, I, I really, I really believe that for Bitcoin to be more than an asset and an investment, but to actually be money and translate it into money, uh, of course, we need to mention. Oh my God, how I forgot to mention this because I thought that it was implied. Yes, Lightning Network. For anyone listening to this, Lightning Network help <laughs> with the I'm so glad I didn't bring it up. I'm so glad. Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <gasps> because I, I always take it for granted. Like, people should know. I'm not talking about, yeah, because you can make Lightning payments. Yeah, sucker. What pay, who, who accepts Lightning payments in Latin America? Even people who are super, super, super into Bitcoin say, oh, actually, no, there's not liquidity for Lightning Network. Yeah, it, it saves a ton of, of commission for sure, but there aren't people actually trading with it because once it's in the Lightning Network, you cannot turn it back and you don't have liquidity for that. So that's a little something. That's a little something that still needs to be worked on. Usability. Great, Sherlock. You have the, you have the solution now. What? <laughs> you, you, okay, you you tackle the commission now. You have to teach people how to use these all other things like have you, working have you tried, the whole other way around. Have you tried Blue Wallet? <laughs> you probably heard this one too. Have you tried Blue Wallet? I don't even know why I'm bringing them up. I don't have any yeah. <laughs> any ownership of them or anything. Yeah. But I uh, use blue wallet, I use samurai wallet, you name it. Samurai wallet. You've used it all. I love it. Okay. No, no, this is great. This is great. This is what you know, this is what I want to hear, right? Because I'm so tired of hearing about what's amazing about Bitcoin. I want to hear about what's wrong with it from people who are using it from all over the world. That's kind of the, <laughs> and and your stories. Oh my god, they take oh, the Lord, help me. <laughs> your your stories. And you know, at the end of the day, I, I do think all this discussion around child or sorry about Hugo and then you know dictatorship and like guns, guns, really. At the end of the day, if you think about it, what it came down to were guns, right? Like those, those they, 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 they literally said that if you don't follow our rules, we will shoot you. And they did. So uh, Bitcoin, or worse. Yeah, or worse, or worse, torture, my goodness. Kidnapped. 
by the by the government yeah <laughs> scary scary stuff but my, my point is is like you know but this all is in that continuum of bitcoin because bitcoin isn't just some like you said it's just a bunch of timestamp one zeros code it's like it just is um the what when it meets the world you know the world is a an ugly, ugly place. Unfortunately, I wish it was a different place, but it just like you know, the more I hear about it, you know, there's some there's oh, beautiful things Canada. about it. What would you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I spent time in India. Have you been to Calcutta? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> okay, okay, you have a point. <laughs> my parents, my parents, my parents are from Kolkata, which is like probably the poorest place on earth if uh or you'd be hard pressed to find places poorer than that and we you know we and i spent a lot of time growing up there as well i'm not indian like i said you know i do have my i i do have my indo Canadian. what is it called i have my my pat technically i am kind i am kind of indian because i do have a passport because my parents are from there it's not a passport Legally. but it's, it's called Legally the oci <laughs> overseas citizenship of india okay that's what i am um but yeah you know, but, you know, I don't want to try and take the prize on any of this. It's, uh, uh, I think, but it's all, we're all connected. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard stories about North Korea and, you know, and, and uh, there's like, there are places in the world where this ha is happening and, 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 um, and, you know, and it's, and it's like, it, it happens very gently and slowly and in this like facade of like makeup and like, you know, and the circus and hand wavery and, you know, announcements and, and sometimes it gets lost on people, you know? And so I, I've been kind of doing a lot of research on this and learning about it and trying to understand the world around me, you know, not just Bitcoin, but like what's going on. And, and this, 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 this idea, so this, this conversation really resonates. You know what, I'm going to stop here because I've probably wasted way too much of your time today. If you want to do a follow up to no, this next, week, next month, yeah, next, sure. whenever I'm game. Uh, but I also don't want to take up your whole day. This has been fascinating. You know, maybe we could do like a Bitcoin yeah. stories, Latin America version or something. Oh my God. I'm having, I'm having a lot of fun, but this, this has been great. Tiana, any, any, any last words on, um, you know, kind of like, contrarian beliefs and then if not what what uh you know where can we find you where can people find you on twitter on linkedin or whatever you use blog okay first of all no waste of time here it has been delightful talking to you thank you second mm. <laughs> uh second well i don't know in what more much more trouble i can get into <laughs> I have I have already I have already talked a lot of shit. Uh, am I allowed to say? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, I, I always click that this isn't five. for children video, but yeah. Um, and you know, I have a lot of people in the Bitcoin scene that follow me around the world. Um, pretty, pretty. I mean, when I look at the people that actually still somehow follow me on Twitter, I get kind of amazed. Um, but if those people, they're entrepreneurs, they're investors, they're Bitcoiners, they're moms, dads, professors, you name it. If these people are listening to you now and if they want to, let's say, work with you or I don't know, is there is there some is there some mechanism by which you do that? Like, do you work with, for example, I can imagine there's a lot of people around the world that want to understand even Latin America better and especially Venezuela. Right. So so how do people connect with you? Oh, sure. Well, I, I, I would say that uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me. My DMs are open at all times in Twitter. I'm uh, at CryptoDiana with, uh, with an, 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 an E, <laughs> an I, sorry. <laughs> um, also, um, yeah, that, that's the best way to reach me. You can also find me on Telegram um, at DN. Uh, Lower what is it? hyphen lower, lower underscore 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 yeah pretty good yeah. not bad born uh, in Canada yeah 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 <laughs> uh A L T so it will be at T N lower score L A T uh A L T sorry <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit hungry <laughs> and uh yeah no basically um, super excited with 
any opportunities that may come along, I'm still super stuck to talk to people like you. And, and I, actually, well, this is a conversation for another day, right? But actually, um, I got invited to like five different conferences. Uh, three of them were in the state in 2019 and they were basically just for that to just tell people what was happening in Venezuela and yeah being doing exactly what I'm doing here right now like doesn't work and two years later doesn't work <laughs> yeah I'm that person <laughs> yeah I couldn't agree more yeah well, I'll tell you my, my my fear is that I I feel like a lot of what happened in Venezuela you know right after the golden age is kind of playing out wait for this on a global scale that's my thesis and I think it's happening it's unfolding and therefore people such as yourselves who have lived through it <laughs> it becomes almost instrumental for people like myself to like amplify your voice in any way, shape or form, because it's only going to be through connecting the dots. Like think about it a hundred years ago, people couldn't have even done this. We couldn't have even been talking. So it was so much easier to oppress even with the tools today, it's still happening. Right. And it's happening. If you ask me at scale. So with that said, on that positive note, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah, no, that's super positive. Yeah, yeah, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Yeah, like I'm, I'm laughing, I'm yeah. laughing, you know? Sometimes all you can do with, like, uh, all of this is just create art, right? Like, you know, I mean, I, I yeah. heard a long time ago that, like, that the best kind of art comes from pain. And so, uh, so you got to kind of, you know, you got to, you got to take no, it, yeah, and turn it, turn it into humor. That, turn that's it why into Venezuelans are, are the happiest place on earth, don't you know that? Do that we again. Want happiest place on earth in the oh. middle of the crisis. We won. Oh. We apparently were up to uh, up to like uh, 2016 maybe or or 15. We were the happy happiest country on earth because we tend to laugh a lot at our misery. So right now we're practically the Joker. <laughs> <laughs> okay 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 well thank you again very very much like i said we'll we'll do this again soon maybe like uh we'll do a little bit more uh around current events and all the stuff that's going on but this has been lovely thank you for sharing i know it's you know not so easy sometimes but uh but yeah we'll talk again soon i'm gonna try and upload this later today <laughs> okay later diana i'll see you later thank you bye bye